So good evening, everybody, and welcome to this session with uh, with Torbay Symphony Orchestra. We're going to be talking tonight about Beethoven's Seventh Symphony. And um, while I was preparing the program for tonight, I started thinking about Beethoven and his symphonies. There are nine of them, and they were a journey for Beethoven. You know. He, he started with the first and the second, which were really symphonies that belong still to the classical period of Mozart and Haydn. And we'll play the opening to the first two symphonies, so you can hear that. To our ears, that doesn't sound too revolutionary, but I can assure you that in time of Beethoven, the fact that he started off with a dominant seventh chord was absolutely like everybody was like this. But still, you can hear that the sound is very much Mozart and Haydn, and also the second symphony, which starts like this. be a Haydn symphony really easy. And then comes the Eroica, the third symphony. That was really, really revolutionary symphony in so many different ways. And you can hear right from the beginning that we're in new territory. The fourth symphony is kind of like a chamber symphony suddenly, and I was just thinking the other day, Mahler, exactly the same, right? He wrote the first, second, third symphonies, huge symphonies, got bigger and bigger, and then he did the fourth symphony, which was a little one, you know, and uh, then came the fifth. So, this is what the fourth is like. Then, the fifth, which was, yeah, everybody knows the fifth because of ba da da da, but actually, apart from that, which is really amazing because Beethoven basically builds the whole symphony out of those four notes, but apart from that, there are so many innovations like going from the third to the fourth movement without a break and using that motive in all the different movements and so on. It was really quite quite a move forward, quite a step forward. <laughs> Together with the fifth came the sixth, which is a pastoral and is a program symphony and is all about nature. And in it, Beethoven describes the molecular nature of, of nature by having all these little patterns all the time, seen by the brook, B, 
dum pum pee dum pum pad and and uh, in the first movement dum da da dum 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 da da dum 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 da da dum 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 da you know all that stuff. So this is how this starts. Three years went by, and Beethoven didn't write any symphonies. And then in 1811, he went away. He was in bad health. He was starting to have problems or with his ears, getting quite bad. And he went away to, to get uh, a rest in a little village in the countryside. And he wrote the, the Seventh Symphony. So, um, so then he wrote the symphony in 1811, 1812, and it got performed in 1813, mm -hmm. and was an instant hit. I mean, Beethoven said that it was his best concert ever. Um, and he was a bit short of cash, so he was really pleased that he managed to do a few more performances and get a bit of money out of that. And Wagner said of the Seventh Symphony that it was a the apotheosis of dance, you know, and I think that's if if you had to sum up the Seventh Symphony in a word, dance would be it. The whole symphony is just one long glorious dance, um, and a lot of them are sort of peasant dances. Uh, there's a Viennese dance in the third movement, and there's a, definitely a sort of Eastern European type dance in the fourth movement. The first movement is, is a dance too. And the thing about all of these movements is that rhythm is the crucial bit about. All of the movements have rhythmic little cells that Beethoven builds up from and creates a whole movement just from these um, these uh, uh, little rhythmic cells, and you'll see that in, in a minute. But that, like the fifth that you heard, ba da da da, um, yeah, the, those kind of rhythmic cells as well, which actually, just out of a few notes, he creates a whole movement. So we're going to we're going to play you uh, a bit of the first movement to start. And in a classical symphony, there are of course exceptions, but the general rule is that the first movement is kind of a serious movement and the structure of it is something which we call sonata form and basically the way sonata form works is that you have an A section, the first section in which the composer presents his or her material to the audience and that's repeated to give you a second chance to actually assimilate the, the material and hopefully remember it. And then there's a middle section which is called the development section. And in that section, the composer mm. takes the material from the first section, which is called the exposition, and starts to develop it in all sorts of ways. So you take, you take, you'll see, he takes little bits of the, from, from the exposition and he starts doing all sorts of things and makes up a whole section just out of those little motives. And then when the development section is finished, we come to the third section which is very similar to the first section. It's called recapitulation and it's sort of a repeat of the first section with some changes, mostly harmonically, but the material is very much the same. And then at the end, you have a coda. And um, the thing about Beethoven that you should always remember is that whereas Haydn and Mozart would do a coda would be dum da da dum 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 bum bum. Great. Beethoven goes on for 115 bars, yeah, of music. And he he develops material in the coda that you would never have expected. You you think in the development section he's done everything possible, you know, what's left to do, and then he always comes in the coda 
and shows you that there's a bit more. Okay, so we're going to start off all very often before the sonata form thing I've just described, you have a slow introduction. It's like you've all just come in from a day's work, you've had your dinner, you still got all that in your head. And the slow introduction is like when you go to the opera and the curtain goes up and the orchestra plays an overture and it's like a transition for you to go from your daily life into the world of music. Okay? And that's what the slow introduction is. So let's play this. So there's two things that I really want you to listen for because this whole slow introduction contains so much of the material for the rest of the symphony and there are two, two things. The first thing is what the woodwinds and the brass do at the opening. You hear the oboe, what the oboe plays the... Hear this, yeah. And the second thing is scales. So here the strings. If we play from uh, uh, upbeat to bar ten, from your semi-favorite. Try and remember those two things, right? The scales and the arpeggio that we're talking about. So let's go, everybody, from bar nine, shall we? Three, four. Listen to the colour of the clarinet and the strings. See one of the thank you everybody. One of the things that that um, became more and more part of the 19th century, you know, moving towards Richard Wagner and his ideas of light motifs and all that was to take a bit of material and use it lots and lots. The same thing, right? And so you there there are things like. In, this bit that we've just uh, played, uh, um, uh, a woodwinds. Can you play me A? Thank you. You hear that? Da yum, 
Okay, play the opening of the third movement, please. Remember that. Chiyom, papiyom. You got it? So already, already here you've got papiya, papiya, payam, papiya, 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 and then pa 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 there's that scale that you heard at the beginning that time was going up yeah pa 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 pi yeah now it's going down da, 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 da. whether you actually register these things when you're listening to a piece of music i don't think it's so important because it works on a sort of subconscious level somewhere deep inside you you feel this is okay, this makes sense. You may not actually be able to say why it makes sense, but you feel that it makes sense, you know? Yeah. So, um, we're going to move on because you're here at the end of the evening, we'll play you the whole thing. But this carries on for a bit. And here you will hear what Beethoven does so often in his music. It's so amazing. He takes these this one note, and he, yeah, pa, 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 pa. and out of this one note, you'll hear that dialogue happens between the first violin and the flute and the oboe. This thing, just listen how it develops. Yeah, this one note, and suddenly it launches into the proper first movement. So here we are, let it be. <laughs> Here we go into the first movement. And from here on, this movement is all that. Yum ba da dum da da dum da that just that rhythm. Those three notes. Yum da da dum da da dum da da dum. The whole movement is built up out of that. And and usually in a in a symphony you in a sonata form, you have two themes, two contrasting themes. One is, uh, the first theme is usually quite sort of, um, oh, I hate these words, but here we go. One is quite masculine, and the second theme is quite feminine, is the sort of normal standard, yeah? But sometimes you get, move, you get symphonies where there's only one theme. It's called monothematic themes, and there's no second theme here in this at all. Because it's all bum ba da dum da da dum da da dum. Just listen. What? All, all it is. I, I think s some of the th something that many of us find difficult with classical music is actually following the logic of the music. You know, so um, it's lovely, and we can sit back and you know listen and think a bit about what we have for breakfast, and then come back into the music, and then think, oh, what have I got to do tomorrow, and then come back again, and yeah. That sort of in and out thing, right? Because it's very difficult sometimes to follow the story that is there. Yeah? But there is a story, you know? Especially with a composer like Beethoven, there's definitely a story. And one of the ways that you can engage in that story and follow is by listening to the dialogue between the different parts and instruments of the orchestra. And there's definitely a whole dialogue going on here between the woodwinds and the strings. Papa, papa, papa. Just listen to that. Okay, let's do it again from the opening of the Vivace. 
de ta à Now we go, the whole orchestra comes in with this, right? And I just want you to think for a few, few minutes. I'm just going to demonstrate to you what happens vertically because it's very easy to be swept along by the melodic energy of the music. And so after this comes this place at bar uh, 89, everybody. And I would just like to have uh, trumpets, timpani, and cellos and double basses, okay? Yeah. So that's all. That's all they do. Yeah? Yeah. The, the second violins and violins, you join in at 89. One, two. One of the things that was really important to Beethoven was silence as well. You know? He uses it really as a dramatic uh, 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 feature. So when we, when we get to the end of this uh, uh, section of, of the exposition, which we could go from... Um, why don't we play from letter E? So listen out for all the things that we've talked about so far. Yam paradam da that rhythm. Listen to the woodwinds because I think that in terms of woodwinds, the, the this symphony is almost my my number one love. The woodwind parts are so amazing, you know. They they as a block they just <coughs> sound fantastic. <laughs> left the oh what's happening here and then at this point you either go back to the beginning of the uh, of the the movement not the slow introduction part but the vivace yeah or if if you repeat it you then play the development section so now we we come to the development section I just want to show you the kind of things that Beethoven does with the development section okay One, two. <laughs> Quiet, 
rhythm do you see he, how he plays around with it over and over again until we get to the recapitulation which is letter I which is almost the same as the opening of the movement but Beethoven gives you added value in that he adds on things for instance in the woodwinds they start they have amazing interjections the woodwinds they go ba 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 let's just play a different letter I that's like the beginning So we get to the place where the where the movement should actually finish, sort of. Um, and let's go. Let's go from letter M. This is this is the place before the double bar, and see what a long and amazing coda comes after that. M for Mary. for later so that you can hear so we don't um, we don't give it all away before before the time but hopefully that gives you some sort of um, uh, idea of how the first movement goes now the second movement is the one that everybody goes ah oh. and and also in Beethoven with the first performance of the symphony with Beethoven they made him play it again you know it was uh, it was by far the sort of highlight the top top number one hit this movement and it's it's pretty amazing in in many respects I think personally that it's a funeral march in a in the same way that uh, the Eroica has a funeral march there are so many things that are similar there's the, the movement is in a minor key and then goes into a major key which is like the Sun comes out suddenly you suddenly feel that wow the Sun is just come out you'll hear this beautiful thing in the clarinets and the bassoons and there's also a fugue which you have in the Eroica too but I haven't read anywhere that anybody agrees <laughs> with me on that and and I, th I think probably the important thing here is again there's a rhythmic thing of be ba 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 and you'll hear first the cellos and violas and basses they, they're coming with the theme and then when they've done it, and it's time for the second violins to come in, you'll hear that they suddenly, cellos and violas, have the most beautiful counter melody. Very quiet. 
side. Second violins get the counter melody when the first violins come in with the tune. The violas and cellos and basses do the accompaniment. builds up until we get to let us see where the whole orchestra comes in. to this wonderful, beautiful uh, theme yeah? in, a, in, a, in, a, in a different key and just listen to the woodwind and it's so beautiful, it's like suddenly we've had all this bee, ba 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 da and suddenly it's like all the clouds clear and the blue sky comes and it's just like, <coughs> so we one bar before the key change, huh? one bar before D. This is 
is another aspect of Beethoven that is always so amazing, and it's his ability to create variation. You know, the idea of theme and variation is something that goes back to the early Baroque. Really, is when it, it really started to flower, and it's a very important uh, aspect of uh, a compositional form. And Beethoven is just amazing. So, if you hear at E, what happens? For instance, we have flute, oboe, and the bassoon playing that count theme that you heard before. Listen to what else is going on in the strings. And there's a dialogue. So we have second violins, cello, and bass doing this uh, pizzicato where they pluck the strings, and there's a conversation which goes on here between the first violins and the viola. At this point, you get a fugue. Now, some of you may not know what a fugue is, that's absolutely fine. A fugue is a bit like a canon, in that you have a theme which gets repeated by the voices, but in a canon, everybody does the same thing in a sort of staged way. In a fugue, you have a fugal theme, and you have a counter theme in which once the, vo once the theme is being uh, played, you go on and do something else, and then another voice comes in with the theme, and then another voice, and another voice. That's how a fugue, fugue works. And I explained to you that's his explanation on one left. And um, as in the Eroica, where there's a really amazing fugue, more or less at this point of the movement, here as well there's a fugue. And just listen how you, you get first the. <coughs> Second violins doing these. Uh, do you remember the scales from the first movement? That's you'll hear here, and here you get the first violins take the theme and they go ding dong dong ding dong, and then afterwards you'll hear that the violas and the cellos take over from that. Let's do it from F. Now cello bass get the theme, and they play the scale. Now the other play the theme.
get a picture. We have the opening with the ba 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 with the counter theme builds up. Then the whole orchestra. Then we get that second sort of theme that you heard here in the uh, clarinets and bassoons. After that, we get further along the fugue, and then we get a repeat of the two sections, and then the end of the movement. Yeah. And so now we come to the third movement, which is pretty much always a, a dance movement. I mean, there are some occasions in classical symphonies and romantic symphonies where the order is swapped around and the third movement is put in the second movement and the slow movement in the third, but it's not very often. The point to, uh, to uh, understand about Beethoven was that Beethoven did not like the aristocracy. He really didn't like them. He thought that they were just people who had a lot of money and a lot of power just because who they were and who, who their fathers and mothers were. Whereas he was a proper important person. He was Beethoven and he was a composer and he was bringing amazing music to the world. And so, you know, there's stories like um, he was a great friend of Goethe. And so there's a story that he was in, I think it was Prince Lepkowski or one of those aristocrats' palace, and he and Goethe were walking down this passageway when they saw the prince and his whole entourage coming towards him. And Goethe said, Beethoven, yeah, come to the side, you know, and let them pass. He said, no, they will stand to the side for me, yeah, because I'm the one who has real worth. So, and he was, you know, he... He was into human rights, you know. He he was one of those. He was a proper person who we'd really like in Totnes, you know, because he <laughs> he not only did he talk the talk, but he walked the walk. And so, for instance, with the Eroica Symphony, which he dedicated to Napoleon, when he heard that Napoleon had declared himself emperor, he tore up the dedication page and said, "Napoleon's just like all the rest of them." You know, he wasn't interested. So. Uh, why I'm telling you all this is because if you listen to a Mozart or a Haydn symphony, when you get to the third movement, it's a minuet and trio. Yeah, and you can see all the ladies and gentlemen doing that in the ballroom, you know. And so you have this thing where you have a minuet which is in two parts, each part is repeated. <coughs> then you have a trio which is a little bit different, it's a little bit slower, and then you have a repeat of the minuet again, and then that's the end of the movement. Beethoven comes along, and he starts writing this thing called the Scherzo, which is far too fast to dance to. I mean, there was no way any of these <laughs> lords and ladies were going to dance to this music. Just absolutely not. It's much too fast. Eroica, for instance. You know, it's like, what, what are you going to do? And so, his Scherzo was a, a, a way of Beethoven sort of doing this to the aristocracy who also paid his bills. You know? So this is what the third <coughs> movement is about. <coughs> beginning of the session, tatia, tatia comes from the ta yam pa pi yam and the scales, pa 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 pa, is the scales that went up before. Okay, sorry, what's that? Uh, uh. <laughs> So, and then we have um, the the trio, what would be the trio part, which is a sort of slightly slower, slightly more gentle, slightly less energetic music. And um, this is a, the Viennese folk song that I was talking about. And I'm I'm not getting into harmony here because it's not the place for it. But the harmonic the keys that Beethoven uses are very unusual. So, 
this movement, which is in F major, the trio is in D major, which is not something that you would expect at all. And um, uh, you can hear the tree. He does the transition by this long A. <laughs> Which allows you then to go to carry on. Yeah? So just by just by giving you this one note, he does this amazing modulation and suddenly you're in D major because A is the dominant note of D major and so it all works amazingly. And this is how the, the this bit goes, the trio goes. 449. <laughs> first and second violins, they play this long A, nothing else. carries on and builds up and then we back into the papiara papara pa 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 and then once again we come again to di da dum di da dum it's very unusual that Beethoven does this so he does scherzo then the trio then the scherzo again then the trio again then the scherzo again so that's a b a b a it's five sections rather than three it's, it's not, not usual and then Beethoven has a joke at the end. And the joke is, just when you think he's going to repeat the whole thing again, the trio, he does this. And we're at the coda, which is bar 641. You all got it? Here we go. <laughs> so this is, we think, is going into the trio again. And then we're into the fourth movement. And this is, without any question, a, a dance. It's again in sonata form. So you've got the exposition, the development, and the recapitulation, and a big coda. Uh, but it's called Rondo Sonata because it also goes round. There's dum da la la da lum da li da lum da la la li da dum comes back over and over again. So we'll just play you a little bit of that. One, two. <laughs> Silence again. Bum ba da dum. Bum ba da dum. Dum da la. And I would like you to hear how this is built up. So we're just going to do horns, uh, brass, timpani, and woodwinds from the beginning ones. <laughs> any good peasant dance in the pub, right? You've got the cellos and the basses going ba ba. <laughs> yeah. So let's do the same thing again, but now with the cello bass. <laughs> violins and violas, they do this thing, they hate it when you say it, but it's called scrubbing, right? <laughs> and they... It, it's a very important thing. Uh, they play lots of notes, very fast, in the middle. They go... Just listen to it. Okay, so 
that's the foundation. And now what Beethoven does from bar five, everybody, is he puts the first violins on top. And he puts an accent on the second beat. So it goes one, two, one, two. <laughs> Suddenly it all changes. And I want you really to listen to this thing. Yeah, this is a very different thing now. It comes from first movement. Do you remember that? And now they go. It's a very legato, very gentle thing. And very important for what happens afterwards. So let A. Bum ba dum ba dum. You remember the first movement? Dum da da dum da da dum da. Here it is. Bum ba dum ba dum. Let's play that first. Again, this whole dodgy thing that we had in the first movement, day um day um day um day. Um. You'll hear there's a dialogue goes all through the strings, um, uh, from the violins down to the basses and up up to the strings, and then <coughs> at letter C, all hell breaks loose until the double bar. Then we have the development section, and before we finish this, because we're going to want to still play the whole symphony for you, I just want you to hear what happens in the coda, which is just. I think it's pretty extraordinary and um, it's where you think that the, the movement is basically has come to an end and this thing that I was talking to you about the little lead, the little dumb, yeah? Which was just like a second theme type thing, wasn't all that important. See what Beethoven does with letter I. <laughs> Start to play the little da, the little da, and the woodman's go, uh huh, the little da, and then everybody goes, the little da, the little da, they go, the little da. You see, there's this dialogue all the time talking. There's, if you follow that, you'll follow the music, yeah? How they, 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 there's, they have characters, yeah? There's, there's, they, they have a, a personality, you know, these little melodic things, and how they bounce around between the members of the orchestra. That's what makes it all. The music really come alive. So let's do that again for it. Let on.
Okay, I think we, we need to stop now because we're going to have a little break and uh, then we're going to play the whole symphony. So, uh, <coughs> you've got, um, what time are we now? So, 10 minute break, just to relax and stretch your legs and then we're going to play the whole symphony. Thank you everybody.
Thank you.